Welcome to episode 52 of the Series About Security podcast for August 14, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Insurance and Security, or Series at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and we're joined again by Keith Watson. He is still alive. <laughs> and, uh, and Mike Hill. And uh, we're, this week we're going to talk about uh, three of three interesting uh, talks from the Black Hat, and I don't know if any of them are from DEF CON, but, but uh, we assembled several articles and we each chose one. And uh, Mike is going to go on the first one. All right, thank you, Preston. Um, so the article I chose to look at was the uh, malicious, malicious chargers uh, by Apple. Uh, we had previously talked about this on episode 42, uh, but we had to wait for Black Hat to occur to kind of know some specifics on how this attack would work. And uh, it's actually very clever. Uh, it's, it's very cool too. I think these security researchers did a, did a good job. Um, what they demonstrated at the conference was um, they used a malicious charger, uh, which they're calling a MAC-10, um, which I guess is the scientific name of the Black Widow Spider. Um, and they created this charger basically using a Beagle board and uh, a, a version of uh, Linux, I think it might have been Ubuntu or one of the free versions, a very low cost um, device uh, that they used to demonstrate the, um, the attack. And what they did during the uh, demonstration was they uh, plugged in an iPhone, and after unlocking the device, they were able to, uh, by plugging into this malicious charger, what the charger did was uh, it, in, it removed the legitimate Facebook app and replaced it with a malicious version right in the same place. So from an end user perspective, they would have just plugged their phone into a charger you know, in a public place and may not have known, noticed any difference when they unplugged the device. Um, so the way they were able to do that was uh, they have an Apple develop developer license and when you plugged in, it just did all this behind the scenes. Um, so that is one way you can get apps onto these devices is if you have an Apple's developer license. Uh, but typically, you know, you're plugging them into a MacBook and it's very obvious that this process is taking place. Uh, Apple has responded to the security flaw and they mentioned that they are fixing it in iOS 7. They're fixed. Fixing it, I'm not sure that they've necessarily fixed it, but what they have done is they've given you a prompt that says, hey, when you plug into these types of chargers that are actually, it sees it as a computer and it says, do you trust the currently connected computer? And then you can say, well, I didn't know I was plugging into a computer. I can click don't trust or I can click trust. Unfortunately, I've not seen any news that they're gonna apply this to the iOS 6 devices. Uh, so what this means is, if you have an iPhone uh, that is less than version 4, if you have an iPhone 3G or 3, uh, you're not going to be able to upgrade to iOS 7, and therefore you're not going to be able to get this patch when it's available that will alert you. Uh, so I guess the best advice is uh, check, <laughs> check your charger before you plug into it. You might want to be cautious about using any old charger you know, in public places or even, you know, private places. When someone offers you friendly, hey, you know, I'll help, you can use my charger to charge your phone. You might want to think twice if you don't know who they are. So what do you guys say? Well, yeah, don't be <laughs> promiscuous in your charging. I guess. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, charging stations that are just set up for you to use can be dangerous. I think the one so, thing that you, you can have on your side is, and I, I've, I've seen this before, if you put, take your device and you plug it into a new computer, it, before you can sync it with iTunes, it requires you to physically unlock the device using the PIN, yes. which is what happens here in this case. So there is there is a security mechanism in place that so when you plug into a new computer, you have, to be able to un you have to be able to enter the PIN in order to unlock it so syncing can occur. And I, I think that's what's happening here. Although it says that it happens, that this, the process of swapping out the apps is not obvious, but when you unlock your device with the pin, that's when the syncing process can occur. Yes. So it sounds to me like even if you have, it, it's basically plug, like you said, plugging it into a new computer. It is. You have to unlock the device. A sync occurs, and it should show on the screen that the syncing is in progress. Well, actually, is that, I, I think the article is unclear to that. I I, I've used Xcode to load new, okay. um, 
new apps on some de devices, and there's not, you do have to unlock it before Xcode can talk to it. So I think that's the key, is you can't load an app onto a locked phone. But right. once you unlock that phone, um, I mean, if you're, wa if you're watching it, you can kind of see, um, actually, no, that, that's, that's right. It'll just replace the app with the one, you just overwrite the app. So it's pretty seamless. If you're sitting there just looking at your phone, so really, there's nothing really telling so you. So they're taking advantage of the developer capability. They are taking a, advantage of the developer capability. Okay. And uh, ironically, I, I forgot to mention this, um, there is a way to protect your phone right now. If you jailbreak it, you can use a tool called Carelock <laughs> to protect your phone. Obviously, so don't use Apple security. <laughs> don't use Apple hack security. Hack your phone, hack and, your phone and, then, and then you can install your own app, but then well, you are, that, are, are that, prone maybe to some other well, that, that's true. <laughs> like, you know, vulnerabilities. That's, that's, that's true of, of hacking your devices. You can actually improve the security of them <laughs> in some cases. So. I, I would not recommend that, but I find not that I've made on part. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Is that all we got to say about that one? Well, we could go on. Then. All right. Well, I'll go, to, I'll go with mine. This one's about a um, uh, talk of Black Hat about ad networks um, and them being <coughs> um, potentially able to act as a, a, a essentially a self-contained botnet of their own. Um, mainly, it talks about um, the ad networks uh, that we all love to hate, I guess, <laughs> on, on, on the internet uh, that uh, serve ads on various websites like CNN or, or whatever, um, and how a significant number of them allow now allow you to allow the advertisers to run JavaScript code on other people's browsers, and how these, this JavaScript code is generally not checked to see what is essentially in this code, so the advertiser, the ad network just lets some person who pays a certain amount of money run JavaScript code on their on their ad network for for a price, of course. Um, well, price they're they're providing the code to upload to <coughs> web browsers to run on their right, device, right, 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 right. Okay, exactly. Right. This code runs on the on the people on the end device on the end device. Okay, and and we're talking about an, an upfront investment of about fifty cents. To get uh, 1,000 unique hosts, so good deal. Not not, not too bad. So uh, they said for $500 you get a billion unique hosts. So for $500 you could run JavaScript on a million different computers, and using this JavaScript code you could essentially create a denial of service attack on a website. And uh, when people were on the site that had the ad. They would be running the denial of service tag. As soon as they left the site, they would not. And essentially, the traces of, of this would be very minimal. Or the, you know, I'm sure they'd have to capture the JavaScript code on their computer, but that would pretty much be it. The users would be unaware that they were doing anything, you know, and, and it would be a pretty, pretty straightforward botnet, and they're they wouldn't infect any anybody, um, but I think they also mentioned that there were. I mean, there were other things that they could potentially do with that. I mean, and, and I have seen ad that I have seen people get infected or have things happen through ad networks before. So this isn't this isn't a new thing. This is just kind of taking it, I guess, to a, to someone of an extreme and doing something that people hadn't thought of doing before. Well, I, I don't know if they've not thought of doing that before. I think that's certainly one avenue that, that gives them a little more control in some respect in a wide variety of hosts to build and assemble a botnet. There was discussion many years ago when Java applets were all the rage that you could distribute an applet and siphon off a little bit of CPU time to do distributed computing. At one point, it wasn't a lot you could do with Java applets running in a sandbox in terms of their ability to make connections to different uh, domains. But you could at least siphon off a little CPU power using something similar. You could put it on a website, they load an app, they would load the applet into a little computation, and hey, you're one step closer to you know sequencing the human genome or something like that. Um, so the question I have, and, and I have not found the answer yet, is I mean some 
browsers have a same origin policy, which allows them to only make network connections back to the domain from which they uh, downloaded the code. And, and I didn't see any mention as to whether that was an issue or if that was something they could violate uh, at all. And I don't know if that's defined here or not as an issue, but uh, certainly there are plenty of browser bugs that can be taken advantage of. So I, I think Firefox 23 fixed the seven or eight pretty critical ones in the last week, so I'm not surprised if that's something yeah. that can well, be easily gotten around. Yeah, it implied in the article that you know advertisers are not interested, you know, because of the wealth of advertising, they're not interested in so much the security aspect, and they want to make things that continue to run on older browsers as well. So I don't know if these types of attacks are more. Seems like they'd be more likely on older browsers, definitely. But could be. You know, they. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, it, it's amazing to me. And it actually, I think, is when I run this device because on my computers, you know, I have like NoScript and AdBlock Plus and everything running. And then I come here and I don't actually have that running on this. And I see all these things and like, man, these pages look so different when you don't have the ads just popping up all over the place. It's really annoying. And I don't know why we've as a society just gone, well, it's okay, let's accept it. I mean, I thought it was funny. I think it was even one of the art, you know, one of the articles we're looking at, you know, it's popping up, you know, the, the news source is popping up all these ads. They're like, come on, can we just look at the information? Why have we become so accustomed to every single page having all these bazillion, I mean, the whole right hand side of this page is just like ads, you know, and why, well, why is that the case? <laughs> well, I think because they're a business and they've got to make money in some way, well, so it is displaying ads. Back, back in, in, I don't know, several years ago, um, you know, pop-up ads were common, and then, and then we had pop-up blockers, and then every browser had pop-up blockers, just built in, built in. Yeah. And, and I, the day is coming, I think, when when they're going to start doing. I mean, in fact, Internet Explorer already has a tracking protection service built into it, but you do have to enable it. But do that track? Do you yeah, track so you, it, it's a base game ad blocker. I mean, they have a ad blocker built into Internet Explorer that you can enable and download lists and and uh, and block ads. But Microsoft is actually one of the ad network uh, <laughs> providers, aren't they? Yeah. Well, it, 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 uses the, it uses the ad block. It uses the ad block plus lists. You can use the ad block plus oh, lists. Okay. So it, well, that's has some tracking protection. Is what they call it. it. Essentially, blocks all those ads that track you. Well, yeah, it's not enabled by default. So only no, the lists aren't enabled yeah. by default. So someone still has to go do it. So that, that's and, a then, and, then, and, then, and then Chrome has ad block plus. Firefox has ad block plus. And you know, and, you, and I'm sure there's something for Safari and. And, and things like that. So, so ad blocking is becoming a lot more common, and and they, so these ad networks are doing themselves a disservice by not being secure. I think they're uh, and anno they are annoying people as much as they do. They're, they're so, just <laughs> focused <laughs> on slightly different uh, right. objectives. Let's say. Well, it's getting money. I mean, their their objective is to make money, and as people stop looking at your ads, you're going to make less and less money. So. So, you know, you should do something about this, or people. I mean, I've advised my entire department to block ads after we had somebody infected with. Well, infected, they they got a malicious piece of malicious code was running on a computer that was like it's like ransomware type thing. You know, it was like we're, we're, we saw you doing this bad stuff. Now pay us money mm -hmm. to get your computer back, and it was pretty easy to clean up, but. They, I talked to them and, and discovered that they most likely got it from an ad. So, so. Uh, I thought you trained them not to click on ads. They didn't click on the ad. It was just JavaScript it was just running on the ad when yeah. they were looking at something else. So, I mean, what, what do you do? How, how do you guard against that when, especially when it's on a popular website? Well, what's well, like interesting too is the users don't run at a privileged level either. That's what's really interesting to me about it is. Running just as a kind of mobile yeah. user was still able to do something. Yeah, basically it shut down the desktop. It disabled like ever ever it hid all the whole OS and it was it was that homeland security. You know, 
you know, we caught you doing this stuff. You know, <laughs> go, go, go to Walmart and get this card and like, oh wow, give us the number three hundred dollars and we'll give your computer back. And then of course I'm sure, yeah, sure you had that does treat your yeah. computer back, but they still no, have access. True. So, but anyway, um, so I advise everybody to start blocking in. It's just because I don't want this. Is not good, good, and acceptable to me. So, um, so that's that's my article. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll see if anything comes out of it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, our last article is about a Samsung smart TV. <clears throat> now, what's interesting about smart TVs is they're uh, basically embedded computers these days. And Samsung has developed several TVs, and, and they're not the only ones. LG is another one. My father owns a pretty fancy TV right now, and it has a lot of similar capabilities. And they're basically running uh, Linux computers connected to a network, either wired or wireless, and running apps on top of that. And these are typically apps built on top of WebKit, at least in the case of Samsung. Uh, but similar open source uh, tools are probably being used to develop a lot of these other TV, uh, multimedia, multi-app experiences. Uh, so, you know, if you want to sit in your living room and tweet about the show that you're watching at the moment, you can do that. If you want to run uh, Skype and do a conference call to the grandparents, to their fancy TV as well, that's all possible. <laughs> And basically, it's all integrated into the TV, which has basically become a big computer monitor, essentially. Uh, so there was some discussion at the Black Hat Briefings Conference about uh, Samsung Smart TV. And basically, the firmware is, like I mentioned, it's a Linux device with WebKit running uh, web pages and these applications. So they suffer from similar vulnerabilities that you would expect to find on Linux or, or WebKit-based uh, Java applications. And traditionally, we have experience with this with other you know, IP-related devices. When you have firmware and hardware associated with a particular service, they don't tend to get updated too frequently. And often, the developers uh, take a snapshot of the code at some point in the past and try to integrate it with whatever device they're working on. And so by the time it reaches market, it's possibly two or three years out of date. And all those vulnerabilities that were patched in that two or three year time span have been fixed in the current code, but the device runs a very old version of it and is vulnerable to those uh, particular issues. Now normally, uh, when we have a device that runs uh, Linux or something like that, that, that's integrated with firmware. Some of these devices don't have the network connection, but that's really how smart TVs work. They have to have an internet connection of some sort in order to function. And the issue here is basically that a lot of these vulnerabilities are popping up. Uh, stuff that was reported, like I said, two, three years ago and corrected in the current code, uh, no, fix, no fix is available currently in the TV. So this is a great opportunity for attackers to take advantage of these vulnerabilities and to compromise the device and have fun with it, which might be you know turning on that, that webcam on top of your TV and monitoring you <laughs> or listening in on what you're talking about or enjoying the same TV show that you are simultaneously. There's lots of other stuff they could do, including, you know, probably just wiping the device and uh, you know effectively damaging your device and putting it in a state where it would not turn on again. <laughs> you know, we call that the warm brick mode, typically. Yeah. So there's a lot of issues here you know, in terms of having uh, a network-based you know, entertainment device, effectively, being available on network, having lots of vulnerabilities. And, and there's just a lot of fun that people are going to have when, when the whole raft of vulnerabilities are available on these kinds of devices. Well, I'm, I'm just surprised at, you, you know, I think this, it seems like this is the way things are going. I mean, you can see this would be very popular. I mean, I remember many years ago in, uh, you know, computer classes talking about, you know, the day's going to come when the TV up on your wall is running at all. I mean, it's like that makes perfect sense. 
Yet, I don't know if this is a matter of security takes extra time to implement, and if it's just a matter of we want to be first to market, we want to get these devices out, because this is a computer, and you have to have that network connection. Well, if you have a network connection, couldn't you build in a process to update that computer all the time so that it's regularly getting updates? I mean, it doesn't seem like that would be that complicated. Don't put it in user's control. Make it so it has to update when it's on the network, which it has to be on the network to do all those fun things like Skype. So just make it happen. Just put a process in place that keeps that, that keeps it up to date. Because like you said, you know, two to three years out of date, there's a plethora of attacks they can run on it and have fun, like you said. Mm -hmm. And you know, you spend all that money on a TV, and the day you bring it home, it's probably open to all those attacks. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the day you bring it home is probably already out of date as well. Yeah. So the, th the thing, of, the thing about TVs, and, and and I think it's a good thing, is unlike um, say a TV you buy at, at, that doesn't have internet access, this one is updatable. So if the security issue does come up and they fix it, you can actually update it. Which should be unlike say you know with a TV that say you buy a new 3D TV and you bring it home and the next day they come out with a new version of it, you know, <laughs> you know you're like, oh jeez, I just bought a new one, no, there's a new version of it. <laughs> this one, I mean, they may come out with new features and stuff like that that you can't get, but, it, but as far as software goes, you know, you will stay, you can stay up to date. So you won't be like, oh, we fixed this feature in the newest version of the TV, but you can't get it. You know, but yeah. you you can get it, and and Samsung has said that they're, they're, they, the, the 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 security researchers did admit that they used an older version of the TV, and that some of these features have been fixed. Like now, as I apparently they didn't have an integrated firewall, and now it does. Things like that. I would have thought that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if you had it, and if you had this version of the TV, I think you could update it over the air, you know. So it had over the air firmware updates and stuff like that. So I mean, what I think when it, I think as Mike said, it's it's first to market thing, and and I've seen this graph of of like a product's life cycle, you know, you have the very early adopters and stuff like that, and, and, and I think in order to start this life cycle, you have to get a product out. So, you know, there's a lot of competition in that space between Sony and LG and every other TV maker yeah. trying to capture, you know, the people interested in 3D. And, 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 and as much as I hate it, as much as I really need to say it as a, as, as a security person, you know, at least they allow you to update your TV and fix these security things after the fact. But it's not it's not a good thing that they're in there in the first place. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, I think it's just the, like you said, the whole life cycle. I know when I'm developing software, you know, it's like first I get it to work, and then I get it to work securely. And, you know, it might take me a day to get it to work, and it might take me three days to get it to work. But you're doing that before it's in production. Before it's in production, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But that's, to me, that's the way these things are always going to evolve because there is a benefit to being first to market there. You know, getting that ground, and people will forgive you over time. You, like you said, they can already say, well, we already got a firewall integrated. They're working on an old model. Well, that's probably what was available when they were doing their testing. And I'm sure they're like, <laughs> by the time it gets to that middle stage, we will have the security in place. When they're early adopters, you know, it's, you know, there's maybe, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of TVs out there, and they're not, you know, a really an attack vector that people would think of, except for maybe, maybe for a black hat conference <laughs> for fun, you know. Yeah. They're not something well, that people are maybe maybe able to monetize. Really. Now, if you look at the so, end, it talks about a, a smart TV spawning a subculture of hackers looking for ways to take <laughs> con content control and security features on devices. So basically, if you provide a computer <laughs> in your TV, people are going to find ways to do interesting things with it. Well, that's true, and and that and that and kind that of it would scare the media, the the content distributors, and things like that. That's what they wouldn't like about it. Absolutely, but yet you know we have uh, we've got Android, <laughs> which you can get a copy of that source and modify it, and then you can install CyanogenMod on your phone instead of the whatever the vendor shipped to you. You know, there's this. 
the ability to change what was there and replace it with something different. Right. These TVs, same sort of deal, right? They're running, they're running Linux. We got source to that. Mm -hmm. They're running a WebKit. We got yeah. source to that. <laughs> yeah. So this is a, a unique, you know, hacker subculture that's more interested in improving the product that's shipped to you right. by modifying the software on it. This is I support that, don't get me wrong. Especially if you can go in and correct the security issues of the devices that they're shipping. Well, this well, is an integrated computer with a really, really nice monitor. That's a good. That you can point. use to watch TV. That's, <laughs> I mean, that's what. That's it is. like that's I right. refer to my my mobile device as a great internet computer that just happens to make phone calls. So. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything else? No. I'll do it. All right, well, thanks, Mike and Keith. I'm Preston Wiley. Uh, make sure you subscribe on YouTube. I always forget to mention that. If you watch us on YouTube, you should subscribe. Please. We have, I think we have zero subscribers, so maybe <laughs> some. <laughs> maybe one. Maybe Keith subscribed. I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.